Hello and welcome back. Let's continue our discussion on biochemistry and today we're going to talk about proteins. So for today, I made some uh, slides for you to view. One of the reasons was that I'm more comfortable teaching this way and another one because you need to visualize a whole lot of things in this lecture because I cannot show you what a protein looks like without confusing you even more. To make this topic a little less complicated, I've broken down proteins into three lectures. In this one, we are going to introduce proteins and understand what they're made up of. We are going to look at their building blocks, just like we've done with carbohydrates. We are going to look at the monomers that make proteins. And then we are going to have a look at all the different things that proteins make as well as all the different uses of proteins. I have two separate lectures relevant to this video. So if you have a difficulty in understanding stuff in English, I've made a separate video for you guys. Um, the link should be above this tiny info box. And this same lecture is available in Urdu and Hindi. The other thing is what I'll discuss later on in this video. By the end of this video, you are going to understand what proteins are, what are they composed of, how they are made, and then what are their uses, what are their um, common objectives, what are their primary functions, and some examples of proteins. And then we have uh, a short lecture about amino acids. Commonly, the only people that see in your daily life that are talking about proteins a lot are your gym buddies you know you have heard them commonly say that bro increase your protein intake or eat lots of proteins and cut down your carbs and stuff like that from this discussion we tend to assume that proteins are important for building up muscle mass and proteins provide you energy to some extent that is true but proteins are generally not used to provide the body energy. The jobs for carbohydrates. We studied that, that carbohydrates are the human body's primary source of energy. But then what is the job of a protein? Proteins are basically construction workers. They're what you can say Bob the builders of the human body. Okay. And there are a lot of Bob the builders inside the body. And even though the calorie output of proteins is almost the same as carbohydrates, a gram of proteins gives 4 calories the same as that of carbohydrates. However, their primary function is not to provide energy. And the reason is that because these molecules, they make up everything from bone to cartilage to your nails, your hair, the horns in your animals that you can see you name it most of the processes inside your body require protein as separate molecules that somehow interact and are necessary for those processes to happen so my question to you is if they can provide the same amount of energy as that of a carbohydrate why can't proteins be used for energy the answer is very simple Take a moment to think about it and then let's discuss it. So if you're going to consume proteins for energy, what are you going to use to repair or build up your tissue? So proteins are basically used as raw materials to build up stuff. I'm going to give you an example uh, since we just since we started this topic with bodybuilding and all the gym stuff I'm going to give you an example in terms of muscle so that you can have a better understanding of why it is important to consume a high protein meal right after a workout your body needs energy and energy is given by the conversion of glucose into ATP but if your glucose is giving your body the energy why do you need proteins? So if you study muscle tissue, you will see that there are there are tiny thread-like structures that are proteins. Alright? There are actin and myosin filaments. Now these proteins 
which are a type of fibrous proteins all right they are making a structure they are making a hardware so that your muscle can move so these actin and myosin filaments move which cause you to flex your biceps and their movement requires energy so basically why do you need protein intake you need protein intake so that when your tissue degrades or bre breaks down during work you can build that muscle tissue up again all right you can repair all those cables that help your muscles move in this picture we can see a lot of different types of proteins i have already named proteins make up hair and nails you can see kidney beans in your picture and you can see a lot of pulses there right and nuts and cashews and all those they are rich sources of proteins a lot of people think that only meat contains protein you have beef you have chicken fish they are good sources of protein but your pulses and lentils are also rich sources of protein then you have proteins in your blood there are different classifications of proteins some of those proteins trap water inside your blood capillaries so for example the proteins in your blood have various functions a very common protein that you've heard before is the hemoglobin the hemoglobin is a transport protein which is used to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide another common protein that you've heard about is the albumin so albumins are used to transport lipid molecules then there are other globular proteins that are used to attract water and why they are used for that because in your vesicles in your vasculature the presence of this proteins maintains the pressure gradient so when you have these proteins present um, they have a certain amount of water molecules surrounding these proteins so that your blood pressure does not decrease also some of the proteins are biocatalyst commonly called enzymes so these proteins basically increase the speed of your chemical reactions that's what catalysts usually do inside the human body these chemical compounds or enzymes increase your chemical reactivity increase the rate of chemical reactivity so that biochemical processes can occur rapidly can occur very fast some proteins in our body are present in an inactivated state called cymogens. For example, fibrinogen is an inactive protein which converts into an active form called fibrin. Fibrin is responsible for clotting blood. The same is with pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is found in stomach and pepsinogen is activated by a lower pH or an acidic environment. So these were some of the things that you need to know when you need to build your understanding of proteins. You need to have a very clear foundation about what proteins are, what proteins do, and different types of proteins. Proteins, there are structural proteins, there are transport proteins, proteins that increase the rate of reaction called enzymes, and active proteins called cymogens. There are proteins that act as receptor molecules on the cell surface. Also, your immune system is made up of proteins. You see, your antibodies, commonly called immunoglobulins, are a type of protein. Your surface antigens are proteins. Without proteins, all of these things cannot be made. And that is the reason why proteins are not used to provide you energy. Now that we are clear about that, let's continue towards the components that make proteins. Proteins are made by amino acids. Now there are commonly 21 amino acids. Some say there are 22 amino acids. But the most common 21 amino acids make up everything that goes inside your body. Some of the books talk about a 22nd amino acid, the selenocysteine. So we are going to have a look at cysteine later on. But you need to understand that a selenocysteine is an amino acid that has an atom of selenium in a cysteine molecule. So let's continue and take a look at what an amino acid looks like. The amino acid is made like a plus sign. You see you have a central carbon atom and as we all know that a carbon atom has a valency of four molecules. 
four atoms can interact with the central carbon atom making bonds. So on the right hand side we have a carboxylic group, on the left hand side we have an amino group. Do not confuse this with an amide group, this is an amino group. Every time your nitrogen is directly connected with the hydrogen, that's an amino group, that's an amine. Whenever your nitrogen is connected directly to a carbonyl group, which is the C double bond O, that molecule is called the amide. Okay, you have so let's recap you have a carboxyl group, you have an amino group, and then you have an H atom, a hydrogen atom. Now, all these three atoms form the basic skeleton of an amino acid, that's it, which means that this is going to remain constant. No matter what happens, the hydroxyl, uh, sorry, the hydrogen, the carboxylic group, and the amino group are going to stay the same. However, the R group that you can see in red is going to change. And this is what gives us all those 21 amino acids. But before we move on to amino acids, let's talk about a Zwitter ion. Now, this Zwitter ion is one of the most favorite questions of examiners. They tend to like to ask a lot about Zwitter ions. Why? Because you need to know its importance. Because it has a major uh, homeostatic role in your body. So, look at this molecule and see that the carboxyl group has an H group attached. Okay. What happens is that this H ion dissociates from the carboxyl group and attaches itself with the amino group, giving a structure like this. So now your amino group has three hydrogen atoms and your carboxyl group is missing that hydrogen atom. So since this is going to disturb the charge on the amino acid before that we didn't have any charge because the net charge was zero okay so generally amino acid is a stable molecule with the net charge of zero but commonly in the body amino acids exist like zwitter ions this arrangement is called the zwitter ion you can see that the oxygen atom has a slightly negative charge because oxygen is highly electronegative which makes the amino group have a positive charge okay so this negative and positive charges are balancing each other and this gives it the property to balance the ph making zero ions act as buffers okay so what's the importance of a zwitter ion that zwitter ion acts like a buffer to maintain the ph of the human body now that we have understood the structure of an amino acid and how it can be converted into a zwitter ion let's have a look at all these 20 amino acids so when i talked about that second part of the video that's where it starts if you want to continue forward with the with the amino acid discussion i would like you to click on the link above and watch that video before completing this lecture However, if you choose to skip this, you can continue moving forward. But I would really suggest that you watch this video completely, including the amino acid lecture, because it is important for you to understand about all these amino, amino acid structures. Okay? These structures are what gives proteins their unique properties. These structures are important for classification of amino acids. So there are two ways that you can memorize it. You can look at the chart and you can just try to gobble it up. Or you can follow me through the lecture where I try to help you understand about all of the different types of amino acids. And in order to, for you to do that, you need to draw every single one of these amino acids. Okay? So if you are going to continue with the amino acid lectures pause this lecture click on the link above and let's revisit this after you're done watching about amino acids for those of you who went to the lecture first and are now continuing with the protein lecture you won't have difficulty in understanding but if you haven't watched that lecture 
Well, I'm trying to make it as simple as I can. Proteins are classified into four major groups. Proteins could be polar or non-polar, or they could be charged or neutral. They could also be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, and then they could be either acidic or basic. You can see on screen that there are four groups in front of you. You have a group called polar hydrophobic, you have a group called non-polar hydrophobic. So those amino acids that do not have a charge, that do not have poles, cannot interact with water molecules and hence are called non-polar. These amino acids are hydrophobic or water hating. That means that they will not be dissolved in water. On the other hand, you have polar molecules. Now these polar molecules can be acidic or basic depending upon the charge. You can see that those polar molecules that are neutral are visible in the green part. Those amino acids that are polar with a positive charge are visible in the blue box and those with a negative charge are visible in the red box. Now your positive and negative charges can also classify amino acids as basic and acidic. A negative charge is an acidic amino acid and a positive charge is a basic amino acid. Let's look at another picture. You have amino acids with electrically charged side chains. You have positive amino acids and negative amino acids. Similar to the previous picture, you have positive amino acids, which are your basic molecules. You have negative amino acids, which are your acidic molecules. So how do you memorize which ones are basic and which ones are acidic? Every time you have an extra amino group, the molecule is going to be a basic because you will have a positive charge due to the nitrogen present and every time you're going to have an extra carboxylic group you're going to have a negative charge because of the oxygen this picture shows you the polar amino acids with uncharged side chains so that you have side chains that are neutral and amino acids with side chains as hydrocarbons are going to be uncharged because the charge distribution will be distributed along those hydrocarbon chain. There's another picture, the yellow box, that shows special cases. Now these special cases of amino acids are amino acids that cannot be classified as either polar or non-polar. For example, you can see the proline. In some cases, proline is classified as polar, while some books called proline as a non-polar molecule and the reason is that it's going to have a positive charge because of the nitrogen present but some books say that it's not going to be a polar molecule due to the charge distribution because of the ring and then we have hydrophobic amino acids which are very common to identify for starters these molecules do not have polar groups attached okay their hydrocarbon side chains have their charges distributed so there are no charges available for an outside molecule to connect to it. The other thing that you can clearly see is the presence of an aromatic ring. You see those benzene rings? These make the molecule hydrophobic or non-polar. Okay, they repel water molecules. So this winds up our first lecture about proteins in which we discuss about amino acids and introduction about proteins. In the next lecture, we are going to study about protein structure, which is as important as the building blocks of proteins. I hope that you understood it really well. I try to keep it as simple as possible and not overcomplicate things. I hope that you watch that video because it is always important to understand stuff before learning them and cramming them without any conceptual knowledge in your head. Uh, because if you do that, you're going to forget it again and again. But if you learn it after you understand it, it's going to remain there forever. If you like this video, please share and subscribe to my channel and write your feedback in the comment section. Thanks for watching.